Hello and welcome to the COVID-19 pandemic updates. I'm Kaya Okikulu. First, the highlights. Well, the Nigeria Center for Disease Control says the new coronavirus variant Omicron has not been detected in Nigeria just yet, as Canada detects two cases with recent travel history to Nigeria. Well, the United Nations Population Fund makes case for vaccination of of production of vaccination, I shall say, in Nigeria during a courtesy visit to the Edo State Government. The World Health Organization describes the emergence of Omicron as perilous, asks that South Africa and Botswana be thanked for detecting the variant and not penalized. Well, thank you for joining us on the program. Well, just when it looked like the year was winding down and taking COVID-19 with it, the virus hits us with a curveball, Omicron. Well, it's a much simpler name for the B11529 variant, but that's as simple as it gets. There's still so much we don't know about this variant of concern as designated by the WHO, but we'll offer you some insight on the program today. Let's take a look at the latest COVID-19 figures, and I'll be back for more. 110 additional persons in Nigeria have tested positive to COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. According to the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, the latest figures were reported from 11 states and the FCT, indicating an increase from the figures reported earlier. Imo logged the highest infections with 27 cases, followed closely by Katsina, which had 23 cases, Rivers registered 20 cases, while Ondo registered 11 cases. Kaduna recorded nine cases, FCT and Oyo had six cases each, Plateau recorded three, while Oshun logged two cases. Ekiti, Gombe and Zamfara had one case each. There were no cases reported from Bochi State, while the latest data also includes a backlog of positive cases and recoveries from Katsina and Kaduna states. The new tally has increased the total confirmed cases in Nigeria to 214,092. 70 patients have been discharged in the last 24 hours, increasing the total number of recoveries to 207,254. Delta accounts for the state with the highest number of cases currently on admission, followed by Lagos, Benue, Kwara, Akwaibam, and Imo states. One person died from COVID-19 complications reported in the last 24 hours, raising the fatality toll to 2,976. Currently, there are more than 3,000 active cases in Nigeria, while over 3.4 million samples have been tested so far. More than 6.4 million eligible Nigerians targeted for COVID-19 vaccination have received their first dose, while over 3.5 million persons have been fully vaccinated. In Africa, there are more than 8.6 million confirmed cases and over 222,000 deaths recorded across countries on the continent. The total global confirmed cases have surpassed 261 million, while deaths are over 5.1 million. The Nigeria Center for Disease Control, NCDC, says it is monitoring the new COVID-19 variant and the possible implications, which will be vital in shaping Nigeria's response to the pandemic. According to a statement signed by the Director General of the agency, Dr. Ifedayo Adetifa, the variant has not been detected in Nigeria so far, and the fears about its ability to evade protective immune responses or resist current vaccines are only theoretical so far. The Presidential Steering Committee is currently briefing the press on this and other COVID-19 responses, and will bring you the latest updates as they come in. Meanwhile, outside Nigeria, Canada says it has detected its first cases of the new Omicron strain of COVID-19 in two people who had traveled recently to Nigeria. The government of Ontario confirmed that the two cases are in the capital, Ottawa. According to the federal and Ontario provincial officials, both patients are in isolation while public health authorities trace their possible contacts. Well, let's now bring you more on uh, this new variant and uh, what we know so far. We're joined on the program by Dr. James Ayanride, who's a senior research fellow at NIMAR. It's good to have you, uh, Dr. Ayanride. So we have a novel variant of a pretty much novel coronavirus on our hands, and it feels like double jeopardy, really. But in terms of what we know about this, what can you tell us? 
So um, thank you for having me. So um, first and foremost, I don't think we should panic much um, about the new variant, um, even though it has quite a number of mutations that is scaring, um, <clears throat> scaring us theoretically. But we've not seen, you know, um, increase in cases, you know, ICU cases in some of these countries that they've reported this variant. And uh, even though um, it was reported first in, um, between Botswana and South Africa, this variant is almost everywhere in the world. And um, I don't think we should panic because um, a lot, um, we still have a lot, to, a lot to know about this new variant. Um, whether it escapes um, vaccines, um, response, um, we, we all need to have that checked in the lab so that we have adequate data to support um, some of the propositions that we have. But at the moment, I don't think there should be any panic over the new variants that we have. So, uh, I mean, we've had the alpha variant, we've had the, the beta variant, the delta variant, and the rest are now a micro. So I wonder uh, from what point of view you're asking people not to panic. I understand that, I mean, this is your field, but for a lot of people, they might need some more convincing. I mean, they don't have the facts, they don't have the data, they didn't deal with the previous ones anyway. All you just heard, uh, you know, were statements and research outcomes from researchers. So from what point of view uh, do you ask people not to panic such that they can understand where you're coming from? So um, the, the mutations that are scary on this virus are actually very associated with the spike protein and the receptor binding domain. And what this means is that these are the regions that help the virus gain access into the host cells. However, there are some other proteins that could be associated with the virulence of the virus, you know, that can cause disease severity. And we don't have sufficient information to show that mutations on these other proteins, you know, or some other target or some other genes of this virus, you know, would enhance severity of the disease. So there's no point in panicking since we don't have such information. And um, even though we might have not detected the virus in our environment, but because we live in a global community, um, we shouldn't be surprised that we could have the virus here at the moment, while uh, most of our labs are still working in sequencing most of our samples. And um, we also need to give kudos to the South African um, epidemiological um, surveillance team for being able to detect this. So it's not like a, a, you know, like the media hype that we have, that we have a new variant from Africa. Yes, it has quite a number of mut mutations on the spike protein, but we need to know, we need to get more data. We need to see, does it increase severity of the disease? We don't know. We don't have any data to support that. And we are not seeing that at the moment. But scientists are working, you know, and scientists are looking at the sequences in relation to, you know, if um, they can escape, you know, um, vaccine-induced immune response in the lab. So until we begin to get some of this information from the lab, it's very difficult for us to say convincingly that we are in trouble. Yeah, and, and, and for, for all we know, this virus is now in Netherlands, it's, it's in Australia, it's in UK, it's in Hong Kong, it's in Canada, it's in China, Italy, Germany. Belgium, even in Israel, despite the fact that they are locking their borders to foreigners. So, and once it's in one place, forget it. It's almost everywhere. But we don't need to panic at all. Thank you. Right. Uh, and and you, you touched on some very important points, and I'll just pick one of them. I mean, you referenced this uh, virus or this new variant being detected in a lot of countries. Canada is one of them. And just before we, uh, you know, we brought you on, we referenced that report from Canada uh, saying that two cases had been detected and they had travel history to Nigeria. So it raises the questions about seroprevalence, uh, questions about our surveillance and the rest. And people would ask, I mean, the NCDC has said so far we have not detected that in Nigeria. But you recall that they say for every one case that you detect, there are probably five more or ten more that are undetected. So really, what are the possibilities? Uh, I mean, what does this mean for Nigeria, seeing that there were cases discovered, detected in Canada that had travel history to Nigeria? So what, what, what do you see that meaning for Nigeria? So th that could mean that we have some of these cases, you know, in Nigeria. 
And at times, it takes a lot of effort, you know, to have some of the sequencing projects, you know, to, to yield results at times. And there could be some other, you know, circulating variants that we might be seeing that, you know, are not very loud or, or we are not, um, you know, that, that are yet to be reported. However, I, um, like I said, it's, um, our surveillance system is working and um, the fact that we've not reported it does not mean it's not here. And even if we report it, my question is always what next? Yes, we found it. So what are we going to do next? What lessons have we learned from what we have seen now? So those are the germane issues, the germane questions we, be look, we should be looking at. So now that it's been reported in South Africa, so it's left to other parts of the world. Yes, every other part of the world began to race back into their sequencing surveillance programs and see how they could detect it. Now that we have detected, so we need to ask some other questions. How dangerous, dangerous is this new variant compared to the Delta variant? And of course, we still have the Delta variant still circulating mm. and you know, wrecking its own havoc. So um, the question should be, um, what are we doing you know, in our own space to prevent the spread of SARS-CoV-2, regardless of whether it is Delta, whether it is Omicron, Right. or whatever new variant that we have. So we just have to keep up with our standards and the things that we feel that we need to do to ensure mm. that we prevent the spread of this virus. Well, Dr. Like Arundel, just, people, yeah. uh, uh, pardon me, just one more thing before we wrap up on, on, on this one. So speaking about what to do next, because that's the question a lot of people will ask, one of the possibilities that have been raised is the fact that just maybe, I mean, you said it's theoretical, but in the event, oh, I mean, the possibility that this variant is, I mean, the vaccines, the current vaccines we don't have, what if there's a possibility that, I mean, it doesn't work for the variant? Does that mean that a new, you know, vaccine will be developed and administered to people in terms of the possibilities and whether or not there's an end in sight to this new variant? I mean, we're at Omicron, the 15th Greek alphabet. Who knows where we'll be in the next few months? Uh, what, what, what does the future hold on a final note? So um, what the future holds is that we need to be more vigilant. Um, we need to also take proactive steps by preventing the spread, you know, like um, the NCDC guidelines that we've all been talking about, like your, the use of face masks, you know, using your hand sanitizers and the likes. But more importantly, COVID is teaching us a lesson. It's teaching us that we should be prepared because now it's COVID. We don't know what could come up tomorrow. So we need to invest more in research. Uh, we need to invest more in vaccine development. We need to, Africa needs to also wake up in vaccine manufacturing, even though it's a tall order, but we have to get there someday. And um, we just need to keep working, right? And see that we understand what the virus is. And more, more importantly, we should not have accurate information. We should not panic right. you know, over some information that we have out there. So thank you. And that's a great place to anchor. Dr. James Ayuride, Senior Research Fellow at NIMA. It's been a pleasure speaking with you and to hear, I mean, some of this you know, information from you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're moving on, the United Nations Under Secretary and Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund, Dr. Natalie Kanem, believes that Nigeria has what it takes to be one of the COVID-19 vaccine producers in the world, noting that vaccination remains the surest antidote to the deadly pandemic. The UN envoy made the assertion during a courtesy visit to the Edo State Government House. Well, the host, Governor Godwin Obaseki, shares the same opinion, and according to him, Nigeria has a lot to gain by producing vaccines. This is an exciting time for UNFPA to be working in a country that weathered the storm of the pandemic, but of course it's not over yet. So we have been part of the WHO clamoring for Nigeria with all your pharmaceutical capacity to be one of the places where vaccine can be manufactured and provided as we know that vaccine is highly protective. Thank you so much for the push on vaccine manufacturing. It's so important that, you know, um, as a country, we must build our capacity. I mean, you know, I mean, look at us what happened again today. 
you know, variant four, COVID variant four is up, you know, people can't travel. I mean, it's, so it's, the pandemics will be with us for, for quite a while to come. So the, you know, the, we can't continue to be dependent. It's, you know, vaccination will now just be part of our lives. You know? um, that's what it's, it's seeming to be. So we have to, you know, as a country with over 200 million people, we can't not afford to not to, you know, have, have a dependency, um, you know, manufacturing uh, uh, vaccines for ourselves. Up ahead on the program, the WHO has been speaking on the new variant. The South African government has also been speaking. We'll bring you these and more as we speak to a research professor in South Africa. And do stay with us. Welcome back. The World Health Organization has warned that the emergence of the highly mutated Omicron variant is a testament to how perilous and precarious the world's situation is. And while reiterating that no region or country is safe until the whole world is safe, the WHO head, Dr. Tedros Ghebreyesus, in his opening remarks of the special session of the World Health Assembly, warned that no country can vaccinate its way out of the pandemic alone. He also asked that South Africa and Botswana be thanked and not penalized for detecting, sequencing, and reporting the variant. And while South Africa's health ministry is insisting that there is no need to panic about the Omicron variant, which was detected in the country, and this follows President Cyril Ramaphosa's condemnation of a travel ban imposed by several countries. Health Minister Joe Pala said the country had been here before, referring to the bitter variant, which was also identified in South Africa last December. The UK, EU and US are among those who have imposed travel bans with Japan becoming the latest to shut their borders. While African countries including Rwanda and Angola have also joined in this measure by restricting flights to and from South Africa. Our medical scientists, our epidemiologists, our clinicians are, re are working daily, hourly, uh, studying th this virus, its characteristics and its impact on, on, on us as, uh, as human beings, as, as, as citizens. Um, uh, among the things which the president outlined yesterday that we still have to uh, 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 understand, led by our scientists, such as the transmissibility of this virus, uh, those, that's a, a matter which our scientists and epidemiologists are working on, whether there is any age differentiation in terms of uh, uh, its uh, transmissibility and, 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 and illness, whether there is uh, increased reinfection uh, for those who had already been infected before, and including also breakthrough infections for those who are the, for those of us who are uh, already vaccinated, and also to to the extent to which the vaccines remain of of, of serious protection. All these matters, as the which are the, what the president outlined as work in progress. We can be rest assured that in a matter of days and weeks, our, our scientists will have actually gone to the bottom of this. But in the meantime, we are doing everything possible to make sure that our health facilities are ready. Um, we know that as the infections rise, uh, people will get sick, some will get severe, especially those who have not been vaccinated. Uh, but we know that there will also be incidences where even those who are vaccinated may get uh, uh, ill and uh, the health facilities should be ready. And that's why uh, we have a housing representative here just to shed light at, uh, at, as the epicenter currently of this uh, variant to give us a sense of the readiness of the health facilities. More on this, we're joined by Professor Lekon Aya Youssef, who's a DVC researcher of Ako Makato Health Sciences University in South Africa. It's good to have you on the program, Prof. Uh, you know, our previous guest referenced uh, what he called media hype, and he said people should not panic. But you are on ground in South Africa. What's the situation like, really, with this new variant? Has anything changed considerably? No, nothing has changed. Um... Uh, and, and good evening to your viewers. The, I agree with that sentiment. Um, I must say I was personally shocked and disappointed 
uh, when I saw the response from, from countries and even worse still from countries in Africa. I just had my flight to, to Lagos through Rwanda cancelled uh, through an email uh, I received earlier in the day. Now, I have said it many times that um, we have to learn to live with the virus. Uh, learning to live with the virus means we should stop headlining uh, anytime we have uh, infections or a variant. Um, it is expected. Once you, we don't get the speed in vaccinating the population as we have in Africa, the virus is going to mutate because it's going to be moving from people, one person to another. It has the opportunity to mutate. So at the end of the day, the, the, the message remains the same. What is going to eventually happen is a function of how we uh, comply with these non-pharmacological interventions like putting on our face mask every time, ensuring physical distance and washing our hands or sanitizing our hands. And of, on, on the one hand, from our, expected from us. On the other hand, is we need to vaccinate. Uh, because living with the virus essentially means you're going to get infected just like you have flu. But you're not going to go into a hospital or you're going to die or you're not going to and you're not going to die so and this is more likely what we're going to see for many years to come mm. so i mean this new variant changes a lot of optics on covid 19. we've seen as you referenced the travel restrictions and i sort of wonder what the options are for you now i mean you're just one of a lot of other people that are going through this and you sort of wonder how this is going to affect things so the WHO has spoken against, you know, these restrictions in South Africa. Even Nigeria has backed South Africa on this. But let's be honest here. If, if the roles were flipped, what kind of response would you have expected from these countries, really? Well, I would have expected them to apply science. Uh, the science that we have currently is that, yes, there's a variant. But we do not know whether it's more transmissible. In fact, today, the latest data we have uh, suggests it might be less transmissible, but it has an affinity to reinfect those who are previously infected. Uh, and we're trying to understand that phenomenon. There's what we call the relative hazard ratio. We are seeing a lowering of that in those with primary infection, but much higher peak. Uh, is increasing those who have had uh, previous infection in wave one and wave two, particularly those who had infection in wave three. So we're trying to understand all of this. And with that understanding, trying to lock up everybody, a uh, screaming that is already escaping the vi uh, vaccine or is more transmissible, it is not backed by science. Not at all. Uh, and, and one thing that is also obvious is that no matter what eventually happens, it seems like we don't learn anything from the previous waves. Because I would have expected that um, even governments would have learned from wave one, wave two, wave three. The knee-jerk reaction does not help. I mean, for example, UK locks South Africa out. But this virus has been found in Italy, in Belgium, in Hong Kong, but they can travel to the UK. So how does that stop the transmission? I mean, I like how you have put it, and I do hope that, I mean, the authorities are listening and, of course, putting all of this in consideration. But I'd like to thank you so much, uh, Professor Lekon Aya Yusuf. And I really hope uh, you find a way around that restriction and come home to Lagos. Thanks. I hope the Nigerian government also keeps sanity and keeps to the evidence. Thank you. Look we forward to coming on soon. Thank Take you very care. much. And you too. So... We have more updates for you on the new variant and the pandemic situation in other countries. Here's a global update. Six cases of Omicron have been found in Scotland, taking the total to nine found in the UK so far. England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland have all restricted travel to Southern Africa when the variant was first detected last week and a bit to slow its spread. So in line with the rest of the UK, we have reinstated the red list of countries and to date 10 countries from Southern Africa have been added to that red list. Anybody travelling back to Scotland from those 10 countries must enter managed quarantine for 10 days on their arrival. 
In addition, anyone arriving in Scotland from anywhere outside the common travel area will be asked to take a PCR test on the second day after arrival and self-isolate until they get the result of that test. And Japan is one of the latest countries to reinstate travel restrictions, banning all foreigners from entering the country from Tuesday. South Korea has also shelved plans to further relax COVID-19 curbs due to the strain on its healthcare system from rising hospitalizations and death rates, as well as the threat posed by the new Omicron variant. <laughs> Similarly, Australia has paused the reopening of its borders because of the Omicron variant. It comes after the country reported its first few cases of the Omicron coronavirus variant. The fact that we've had a new variant, that is not a surprise. We've been saying all through the pandemic that new variants will come and we'll deal with them as they turn up. We'll get the best information, we'll work together, we'll make sensible, practical, balanced decisions. And my, my key message to people is just to remain calm, do what you're doing, uh, follow all the same usual procedures. Portugal has detected 13 cases of the Omicron variant of the coronavirus, all involving players and staff members of Lisbon Soccer Club, after one player recently returned from South Africa. And finally, Philippines President Rodrigo Duterte has urged citizens to get vaccinated as the country launches a mass inoculation drive amid fears of the Omicron variant. Authorities hope to vaccinate 9 million people against COVID-19 over three days, deploying security forces and using tens of thousands of volunteers to help administer the program. Visit our website, channelstv.com, for more updates and a better understanding of the pandemic, plus other stories all at your fingertips. There you see the story about Rwanda banning flights uh, with Southern Africa over COVID-19 fears, and much more. Well, that's the program for today. Thank you for watching. I'm Kaido Kikyulu. Do stay safe.